<laughs> right, let's get going. So, um, firstly, I, I like to sort of um, make these lectures as fun as possible. Um, so I, I bought something off eBay that I thought might entertain you. So I bought this thing off eBay. And there it is, there. And it's actually a useful gadget, or it could be a useful gadget. I'm going to pass it round so you have a look at it. And my first question is, what is it? And my second question is, how could it kill you? Okay. Now, very seriously, this could actually kill you. Okay. So do not nick it and plug it into the mains. Okay. I would like it back. It's not. It's completely safe now. So the questions are: I'd like somebody to answer at the end of the lecture. What is it, and how could it kill you? And I bought it from China for one pound fifty, including shipping. So maybe some Chinese people that might know what it is, but don't shout out. Here you go. <laughs> right. So that 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 with that out of the way. Uh, I think my battery's low. Right, so here's an overview of today's lecture. I thought I'd recap last lecture. Now, this is the... Um, sorry, can, if you couldn't talk, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I wasn't here to teach you about the op-amps uh, uh, last lecture. So, the, so Arthur did one of my lectures a couple of lectures ago. So I'm just going to recap what he should have taught you. Um, then we're going to do a very important topic that's called diodes. And this whole lecture is effectively about diodes. And this is an introduction to diodes. And they're a very useful topic. And you know, whenever you build any type of electronic circuit, you will be using a diode. So this is sort of a general introduction to diodes. And I've tried to keep it quite practical. So <coughs> Arthur should have taught you sort of the practical implications of op-amps. So he should have taught you that basically, once you know acceleration, you can integrate with respect to time and get velocity. And you can also, um, once you've got velocity, you can integrate velocity with respect to time to get position. And we, we, he should have introduced this very, very useful um, device, which is a piezoelectric crystal. And it's effectively just literally a quartz crystal. But it's got the very special property that when you squish it really, really hard, um, you basically deform this crystalline lattice. And the more you squish it, and the more you squish it, effectively charge appears on the, on the top and the bottom surface of the crystal to sort of keep the, prote the potential of, don't forget the notes, um, to keep the potential of the crystal neutral. And this charge here that appears on the surface of the crystal when you squish it can be sensed with an operational amplifier. And Arthur should have gone through this with you, that basically if you put a mass on top of your, your, your quartz crystal, then you get this charge that appears. And if you attach a wire, effectively this charge can flow out of your crystal as current. And it's a very, very small amount of current. And you can derive, through some maths, that the, the, the current is proportional to the change of acceleration with time times this mass here. So what we can do is sort of, if we rearrange this equation, so we, we try and get this A on its own, we can integrate both sides. So we go integral I dt, integral that dt, and we can go 1 over m is proportional to, well, the integral of I dt is proportional to A. So what this means is, if we integrate this current that comes out of our crystal with respect to time, we can get the acceleration, or something that's proportional to the acceleration, and um, this can be helped to, you know, um, figure out where our rocket is and you know, whether it's upright or whether the car's crashed and whether we should deploy the airbag. So this is all just recap from a couple of lectures ago. And he should have taught you this circuit um, where it was effectively an operational amplifier circuit with this, with this capacitor in it. And this capacitor is effectively an integrating component. And when you do the maths for this circuit, what we find is that the voltage V out is proportional to, so we go through this, is proportional to the acceleration. So if we attach one of these um, piezoelectric crystals to the input of our op-amp, the voltage that comes out of our op-amp is acceleration. That's a very useful property to know, because we can shove that into a computer, we can digitize it, and then our computer knows where we are relative to where we were. So you know, when you, when you play those games with your tablet and they've got accelerometers in the tablet, that's all it's doing. It's using a circuit like this to feed some voltage into your computer so it can figure out you know, whether you're going left with a car or right with a car with your tablet. <clears throat> And <coughs> this is a general integrating uh, unit. So what we can do is if we want to sort of integrate again, we can just stack two of these. So this is the acceleration. So if we integrate again by stacking another one of these integrating units, we get uh, velocity. And if we stack another one, we get distance. So we can calculate ex from acceleration, velocity, and distance. So this should all just be basically a recap of last lecture. Did Arthur show you this video of what happens when you, did he show you the video? He did. It's fantastic. So, yeah, I think what happened in this is actually somebody coupled the, um, 
I think some, some guy just coupled this accelerometer in the wrong way to the op amp. Like literally, this mechanical engineer went bloop, and the rocket didn't know what, where it was, and the consequences were absolutely disastrous. So this is, this is how critical these type of things are to, you know, getting electronics wrong can really make your day bad. Um, then you should have gone through this with you, which is effectively, um, how many of you have done this in the lab already? Hands up who's done this in the lab. Yeah, so a good few of you have done this in the lab. Um, it went through this sort of circuit to amplify the, 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 the potential from these little, um, what are they called, strain gauges. Um, and I'm going to stand near this thing. And he should have shown you this circuit. And we went through this circuit again, actually, in the examples class. And incidentally, the examples class tomorrow at 9 o'clock um, is going to be Arthur and me there. And we're going to sort of answer any general questions. We'll go over anything. So there's no, I don't think we've got any specific, Arthur might have a little bit of material for you, but there's no sort of exciting material, but we're going to, we are, we'll be troubleshooting any issues because it's sort of just before Easter and run up to the exams. So that's what's happening tomorrow. Right. <coughs> any questions about all of that? Because that, that, that you should be, any questions? Happy to go through anything. No? Okay, right. So now, on to some new stuff. So, introduction to diodes. So, I have to say, diodes are a huge topic, and I've actually spent many, uh, maybe, well, 15 years of my life studying diodes, okay, in one form or another. And there's a lady, actually, a visitor from Madrid in the audience who's done pretty much the same. Um, and there are vast topics. So this is like a little introduction to, you know, various aspects of diodes, and they really are a, a critical part of all our daily lives. And if you want to read more about them, you can look in this book, and there's the page references. So... Diodes are a really huge topic. And you might think, oh, diode, what's that? Well, you see diodes everywhere. So laser diodes, so here's a, here's a laser diode. So this is a laser diode in here. It's a special type of diode that's specially constructed to emit light in a straight line. So that's a laser. So lasers, m many types of lasers are also diodes. You might see light-emitting diodes. So there's a, a light-emitting diode that's making this thing glow red. So that's another thing you might use every day. Power diodes, power diodes are used, to, in fact, these are sort of the easiest type of diode to understand. They're used to effectively convert AC to DC, and any, any piece of apparatus you plug into the mains will have a power, power diode in it um, uh, to, to effectively convert the AC to the DC. And this is what we're talking about in this lecture. And the other type of diode that will come to are solar cells. So solar cells are also diodes, so this whole field of renewable energy is also, uh, or harvesting the sun's energy, is also diodes. So it really is a vast, vast topic. And I'm just trying to show you a tiny section of it today. <clears throat> Anybody figured out how it'll kill you yet? Go on the blue, no? No, not yet, okay. So we're gonna be looking at power diodes first. Or, or effectively, whenever you want to power something like your Raspberry Pi from some type of power source, you'll have to use some type of diode. And, um, yeah, right, so power diodes. Let's look at power diodes, so the basics. So these are diodes up here. So all these are diodes. They come in sort of different packages and different forms. And this is the symbol for a diode. It's very important which way you put around a diode because I'll explain this why in a minute. But can you see there's a bar here? So this is the symbol for a diode. Can you see there's a triangle and a bar? Well, on these packages for diodes, you can see here there's a bar here there's a bar here, and there's also a bar here. So this bar here indicates which, so which, which way around this, so that indicates this bar here, so it indicates which, round, which way around it goes. So by looking at this diode, you can instantly see, oh, the circuit symbol is actually not this way around, but the other way around, because the bar's there. I have no idea which uh, way around this is. This is a special type of diode. I think it's a very, very high voltage, high power diode, and it's in a, it's in a metal case here, a bit like a bolt, so you can bolt it onto a heat sink, so it can dissipate its heat very easily. So you'd have to look at the data sheet to figure out uh, which way around and wire that one up. <coughs> so the idea of a diode is it lets through current one way. It's like so a little trap door. You can think of it in mechanical engineering terms as a pipe. So here we've got some charge. We've got some positive charge flowing along here. So it's flowing, flowing, flowing. And we've got some type of a, a, a trap door here. And because this trap door is set up like this, the charge quite happily flows through it. And then what happens is when we change the direction of the charge. So instead of having the charge flowing, uh, I might just, oh, I wonder if I can, my batteries are flat, I'm sorry. No, it's the wrong type of battery, never mind. Um, instead of having charge flowing from left 
to right, if we swap the, the direction of the charge and we have the charge flowing from right to, to left, you can see this trapdoor effectively stops the charge flowing. So it's sort of it's going against the trapdoor so it can't come through. So you can sort of in your, in your head, you can think of a diode like a one-way trapdoor for charge. And I don't know how many of you have got a cat at home or, or had a cat. If, you, if you've seen these special type of cat flaps, they've got a little twiddly wheel on them. And you can set it to a sort of a special, a special way so it just lets the cat come in or just lets the cat come out. It's sort of a one-way cat flap. So you can think of a diode effect. Woo! I'm actually going to stand. This pointer is too, too irritating. I'm going to stand here. Um, so you can think of this. Um, you can think of a diode as effectively a one-way trap door um, for charge or a one-way cap flap for charge. So if we put it in a circuit, um, if, we connect, if we connect the diode this way around and we've got a light bulb in our circuit, the charge basically flows around here through the light bulb. It shines. The charge goes around here um, through our diode and back to negative contact. And this is good. Our light bulb lights, um, the circuit works. Now if we swap the polarity of the of the power supply. So now charge tries to flow along here, but it can't flow because it's sort of this bar thing here. It can't flow through the diode the wrong way. And what this means is the light won't light. So you can think of this, you know, this looks like a one-way sort of trap door for charge. Okay, so this is really the key use of power diodes. The key characteristic is they let charge through one way, but not the other. So if you draw the current voltage curve for a diode, if you apply basically a negative voltage to it, it's off. It lets no charge through. Now, this is like the ideal diode. This diode doesn't exist. This is like the ideal perfect diode in my head. However, and then as soon as you put a positive voltage on the diode, so we're applying charge the other way, instantly we can put through as much charge as we like and our circuit will run. So it's like either off or on. Okay? So when we apply a positive voltage, charge flows, and we apply as much charge as we like flows, and when we apply a negative voltage, no charge flows. Any questions so far? Anybody confused? Anybody got any burning questions? Just shout. It's quite a small group, so just very happy to make it more of a sort of seminar than a, a lecture. Nope. Okay. Do, do stick your hand up. If you've got any questions, just stop me. I'm really happy. So um, <coughs> that was the ideal diode. Now, we're going to make it less ideal, but in a few slides. So we just need to understand it like this for the time being. So diodes, the bridge between AC and DC. So so here we've got some type of a digital device. So this could be your MP3 player. This could be, um, um, you know, this could be your, your computer. This could be this device. This could be any type of low voltage piece of equipment. Now in the mains out of this three prong plug, we get 240 volts and we can get up to about 13 amps. Um, so somehow we've got to convert, if we want to run any type of device, or any type of interesting device, so you know, anything that's intelligent, we've got to step down this massive voltage to something that's a bit more appropriate to run our really small computers and our devices. And to do this, we use a transformer. So I think Arthur's mentioned transformers to you already. Is that true? Yeah? So you know what transformers are. So this is actually just a, a transformer you might find in uh, high voltage or ceiling lighting, for example. And um, just a couple of copper coils. And what it'll do is you'll quite nicely step down this 230, 240 volt supply to 5 volts and run our chip. But the problem with this is, I'll explain in a moment. The problem with this is that, can you see this supply is effectively turning on and off 100 times a second? So here, there's actually no, um, there's actually no, uh, voltage supplied to our device. And here, or if we look at the 5 volt side, there's no voltage supplied to our device. Then there's maximum voltage. Then there's zero voltage. Then there's maximum minimum voltage. Then there's zero voltage. So can you see, in effect, our device is being switched on and off 100 times a second. Now, I mean, my computer probably takes a minute to boot. I mean, I wouldn't want it being switched on and off 100 times a second. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do anything with it. So we need some type of way to transform this effectively, this this um, AC voltage that's going on and off 100 times a second into a nice DC voltage that all of our electronics can run on. So here's sort of a summary. So electronics don't like, so there's an unhappy chip. Electronics don't like AC because you turn them on and off all the time. Electronics like DC, so a nice steady direct 
um, supply of current. So somehow we've got to make a device that will turn this AC to DC. Point is really irritating. Okay. So here's a question. Can anybody guess what component we'll use to, to turn this AC to DC? A diode. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Somebody's awake. So the cheap way to do, or the easiest way to do this is effectively just slap a diode in the circuit. So here's our input voltage. So for the, for the moment, I, this really is a terrible pointer. Um, so for the moment, I'm going to simplify. I'm going to get rid of this transformer because this lecture is not about transformers. I don't care about transformers. I'm just going to say it's supplying a nice 5 volt supply here. So we've got 5 volts AC um, and some type of load. So what we could do is in this circuit, we could put a diode. And what this would do is it would let, just let through current when there's a positive voltage here and power our device. And then when the, current, when the, when the voltage went negative, it would just let through no current. And um, what we get is effectively it's called half, this is called half-wave rectification. So this is a proper, there's a proper word for it. And can you see effectively we're just losing this bottom section um, and we're allowing through these positive pulses. And um, if you buy off eBay, just like I did with this thing, if you buy like a, a fake iPhone charger, um, you'll find this type of rectifier in it. So you just have, because they want to save money, they want to save diodes. So just put one diode in it, and it'll do some type of dreadful um, w w a half wave rectification. And uh, this is actually something you can do, um, but it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty bad. It also makes, you, it makes your, your chips pretty unhappy because, okay, we've got positive voltage here, we've got rid of our negative voltage, but our device is still off for so long, on, off. So you see, we're still, we're still turning on and off, but we're just not subjecting the device now to negative voltages. So, we've still got an unhappy chip. So this is, so if you then spend a few more pounds on your iPhone charger from eBay, they'll say, oh, okay, well, we can afford another three diodes. And what you'll find in your slightly more expensive iPhone chargers, or ones that actually work, um, is this type of arrangement of diodes. And this is a very special arrangement of diodes called a bridge rectifier. And you see there's, there's another three diodes in it. And we're going to, ex I'm going to explain to you how this bridge rectifier works. And this is a very important universal circuit. And it's so important that, in fact, if you, you can actually look in an electronics catalogue and you can buy little packages with four diodes in them, sort of all integrated, because whenever you need to convert from AC to DC, this is the universal way to do it. There is no better way. This is like the universal way of converting from AC to DC. And I'll explain how it works with some animations. So here on the bottom, we've got a little diagram of the waveform of the voltage coming into our circuit, okay? So what happens is when we apply a, a positive voltage, so we've got the positive part of the voltage coming from our transformer, the, volt, the current goes up here, along here, through this diode, down here, through this load, down there, and then up there, down there, and then up there and down there. So the current's flown along here, through this diode, along here to our, this is our load. This could be an MP3 player or something. Along here, up here, around there and back, okay? Now this is the clever bit. When we reverse the voltage, so now we've got a negative voltage here. What happens is the, the so we've got current flowing the other way from our supply, it flows along here, along here, through this diode, through our load, down here, through here, then back up there, back there, and round there. Now, what do you notice about the direction of the current um, in the, in the, when, the, when the voltage was positive and the voltage was negative? What's, what's, what do you notice about the direction of the current through our, through our load, through our device? What do you notice? The guy nodding there, what do you notice? It's the same way, right? So what this arrangement of diodes has done is it's, it means that no matter what way we apply a voltage, um, all the voltage comes into our circuit, our output will always experience current flowing in the same direction. So, yeah, so let's do another cycle just to make sure you've got it. So, voltage positive, volt current goes along there, through there, down there, down there, down there, back and round there. Then we flip the polarity of the supply, so we're going negative. Volt current goes through there, through there, through there, through there, through there, round there, and back round there. So again, we've always got the same direction of current going through our device. 
And so here we go, this is it. So no matter what, what direction our supply or voltage our supply has, we always have one direction of current going through our load. So this is the result. Can you see? So if, if you compare, if you compare previously, so we look at the half wave rectification again. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. So there's the half wave rectification. Can you see we, we sort of we're on and then we're off for a long period, and then we're on, then we're off for a long period, on, then off for a long period. Well, if you compare this to the for the full wave rectification, we're always on, but on, 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 on. We still go off just at this time here. So here we're off, here we're off, here we're off, here we're off. But it's certainly the situation looks a lot better um, than previously. And if you tried to run a device off this, it would probably work. It's not very good, um, but it's certainly a lot nicer than applying a negative voltage to the device. So your chip or MP3 player would be moderately happy with this voltage. Okay, any questions so far? Anyone want me to run over stuff again? So... Um, I'll put all this on Moodle, obviously, um, so you can just have a look at which way the, the currents flow and stuff and think about it in your head a little bit. I think there's some example sheet questions on this too. Um, it's not really difficult. Yeah, so there we go. Half-wave rectification, full-wave rectification. And realistically, in any sensible device you guys are going to be designing, you want full-wave rectification. Like, this is sort of joke rectification. Like, anything that's got this in it, just bin it. <laughs> um, so... Here we've got our, our full wave rectification, rect, rectified signal. So we've got the signal going on, 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 on. Now what happens um, if we stick a capacitor? So if just at the output of the bridge rectifier we stick a capacitor, what we can do is we can smooth the load. We can smooth the output waveform a lot. So if we couple in there just a capacitor, what the capacitor does is it sort of absorbs current or, and voltage. So it sort of absorbs power whilst we've got a positive voltage applied to the device, and it sort of gives it out when, when the voltage goes off. So the, the can you see the capacitor's effectively sort of smoothing this waveform here, this very bumpy waveform, to something that's a lot more like DC. So this isn't perfect DC, but this is, still pr this is much, much nicer DC. And in reality, you could actually power a device off this. And you've got what, what this is called. This, can you see this, this sort of bumpiness to the... To the to the DC. This is called ripple. It's like ripples on a, on a pond. And we've got happy chip, because it, uh, it's working. So, I'm going to explain to you how this capacitor functions. Now, this is quite important, because when you're de designing power supplies, very often you need to pick a capacitor, and you've got to pick a sensible capacitor. So, what happens when we first apply a positive voltage of our AC signal up here? What happens is current flows from our bridge rectifier into our capacitor and into our load. So the mains is charging our capacitor and it's running our, running our device. Then, maybe if I just stand here, when, when the mains voltage turns off, so here's the extreme case, it's absolutely off, what happens is current flows back from our capacitor and powers our, powers our device. So actually, whilst the mains is off, the capacitor is actually supplying the, the voltage and the current to our load. And then when the mains voltage rises again, the capacitor again charges up, the mains is powering the load, ready for the next time when the, when the voltage drops again and the capacitor takes over. So you actually see the capacitor in this circuit is powering the load. Okay? And the process continues. There we go. Yeah, so here's a, here's a picture of a river with some ripples on it, and this, this here is called ripple. And it's quite important because sometimes... You know, you're always going to have ripple on the voltage in your circuit. And sometimes you can say, oh, you know, I can tolerate half a volt of ripple. Or sometimes you can say, oh, I'll, I can tolerate, um, you know, 10 millivolts of ripple. And the bigger the capacitor, um, the, the less ripple you have, because it can sort of absorb or sort of give more power to the load when the, when the mains is off. So, have I just given you an answer to the question? Yeah, how much might you make the ripple voltage smaller? The answer is um, make, a, make a big capacitor or have a load that uses less, less, less current. So if you want to estimate the size of the ripple, so I think this is the only equation in here, so I want you to really enjoy this equation I'm giving you here. Um, if you want to estimate the, um, the size of this ripple, so the ripple is equal to I over F times C. So F is the frequency of the mains, which in this country is 50 hertz, and the US it's 60 
C is the size of your capacitor, I is the, the current your load is drawing, so, and V is the ripple. So you can see basically the more current you draw, the bigger the capacity you need to maintain the same level of ripple. So, here's an exam question, and I think I'd like you to do this. You're designing a 5 volt DC power supply to deliver 10 milliamps, so quite a small current, um, from a 50 hertz supply. You pick, a, you pick a, um, a 100 microfarad capacitor. What ripple voltage would the power supply have? Is this reasonable? Um, what value of capacitor would you need to have a ripple of 0.2 volts? So off you go. Have a go at that. Go on. First person to get the answer. Just have a quick go. So literally, just pop the numbers in the formula and, uh, and what answers do you get? So what ripple voltage would you get for the power supply? Is this reasonable? And what would you need to make it 0.2 volt supply? Who's got an answer for me? Have you got an answer? Man with the calculator there, that's a good sign. Have you got an answer? What's the value of ripple? Anybody? Do you have it? Two. Do you think two? So, the answer we've got here is 2 volts. Do you think 2 volts is reasonable for a 5 volt supply? What percentage is that of ripple? It's quite big. It's like, it's about 50% ripple. So, you know, like, if we go back. So if we go back, this, this isn't just a little drop. In, in the example I've given, this ripple is like way down here. So the device is almost off. Um, so what value of capacitor would you need to have a ripple of 0.2 volts? Have a go. So just, just rearrange this. So say um, V ripple equals 0.2, and then give me the value of capacitance. Have a go. I'm going to might pick on somebody who's not writing. So you're safe. You got one? What'd you get? You got one yet? You got an answer? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. A, thou a thousand, you say? A thousand. So the answer to the second one we've got is you want a cap capacity of a thousand times ten to the minus six. So that's reasonable. Okay. So that's that'd be maybe a five mark exam question, very easily. So you've all got that. So there are the answers. So two volts is that reasonable? No. A thousand times ten to the six would make it a lot better. Right. Um, Any, any questions on what we've done so far? Nope? OK, yeah. So a ripple of, of 2 volts might be acceptable if you're running something like a drill or some type of really rubbish um, DC motor that you don't care about it being off for a bit. Um, but if you're running something that's doing computation, a ripple of 2 volts would be absolutely crazy. So you'd want to, you know, you'd want to really get rid of that ripple. Now, let's do some more on getting rid of ripple. Now, really, if you've got an expensive computer, like an, you know, an Intel chip or something, having any level of ripple on the, on the power that's doing these computations is absolutely terrible. So what you do is you use something um, called a voltage regulator. So this is a voltage regulator here. And what this thing is, is it basically takes dirty, eight, dirty DC, so this is fairly dirty DC, with like peaks and what, noise and whatever, and it smooths it all out perfectly. So it turns this dirty, t dirty DC into perfect... Um, a DC you might use for computation. So let's have a look at using voltage regulators. So this is how you use a voltage regulator. You literally just smack it in um, after the capacitor and before the load, and it literally just cleans up all your, all your dirty DC. So if you want to make yourself a little power supply, you know, in your project or something, just get one of these. They cost like 20p. Smack it in after the, um, the, uh, the capacitor, and you'll get absolutely wonderful uh, DC to run anything you want. They do actually, um, I'll show you how they work in a minute. Yeah, so this is how they work. All that's in this thing is it's effectively, so it's got a few little clever components in it. 
But all it is, in effect, is a variable resistor. So this thing is literally just a resistor. And, but it's a bit clever. So what it does is it effectively adjusts the resistance, so it adjusts its own resistance to absorb sort of effectively any peaks in, in the power supply. So it sort of just shaves off all the bumps on the top of the power supply. So when there's, you know, when there's lots of voltage, it might bump its resistance up, sort of get rid of those, those peaks. And when there's not so much voltage, it'll sort of bump its resistance down. So it's just sort of shaving off all the bumps effectively by changing its own resistance. And um, <coughs> the disadvantage of using a device like this is because it's basically absorbing all this power, so it's absorbing all the peaks just so your circuit doesn't see it, um, they do get quite hot. So if you get one of these, it's going it's to sort of dissipate all this energy here as heat. So make sure it's bolted. So you can see there's, a, there's an eye there. Make sure it's bolted to the box of whatever you're designing to dissipate the heat, because otherwise it'll get red hot and uh, burn. So pop a heat sink on it. So that's the trick. That's the final magic trick to getting perfect, a, perfect DC. So that's it. You can now design power supplies that are half reasonable. Okay, so you can power any device you want. So, any questions on that? It's all quite easy, really, wasn't it? Oh, is that a hand? Is that a hand or a stretch? Ah, oh, okay. I'm really disappointed. <laughs> okay, so now let's look at the less ideal diode. So this was the ideal diode we looked at, and effectively it was off or on. Okay, so it's absolutely on or off. But anything um, in the real world has resistance. So if you measure your own body, you're going to have a resistance. If you measure the, the, the resistance of any electrical component, it's going to have some resistance. So sort of the less ideal model for a diode is this ideal diode with some resistance. So with an additional resistance to it. So let's look at the voltage current curve of that. So what happens? So this is the ideal diode voltage curve. It's off or it's on. And once we add some sort of just resistance in there, because it's a thing, right? It must have some resistance. It's an electrical component made of stuff. So it's got to have a little bit, a bit of resistance. We get this sort of this curve here. So it's either off or it's on. But the slope of this curve, because it's now got some resistance in it, is determined by um, V equals IR, so the voltage over the current. So this is effectively just the curve of a resistor. Okay, so that's a sort of a, a less ideal diode curve. And of course, what this actually means is when the diode's on, you're going to dissipate some heat over it. So if you're designing really, really, really big, chunky power supplies to supply lots and lots of current and voltage, you'll probably also want heat sinks on your diodes. Now, let's go a little bit deeper. <coughs> now, I have, what I'm going to teach you now is sort of, I'm going to try and, I need to teach you about solar cells and things like that because they're quite important. Now, I don't want to make this a course on semiconductor physics. So I'm just going to sort of skirt around the edge of, the, of this theme and teach you like the absolute bare minimum you need to understand what's going on in the circuit. So when you think about a diode, it's made of two materials. Okay, so this is all you have to remember. It's made of a material called an N-type material, and it's made of a material called a P-type material. The P-type material has lots of positive charges in it, and the N-type material has lots of negative charges in it. And when you, when you sort of look at it, it looks like this. So here's some P-type material with positive charges and N-type material with negative charges. So this is how they're made. And um, you'd, so I'm just going to tell you that because you've got this, this charge in this, this sort of this, this built-in charge in your diode, it's full of charge effectively, it's going to have a voltage drop over it. It will have a voltage. So when you pick up a diode, it's going to have, because it's got this charge in it, a voltage over it of like 0.6 volts always, okay? Because of just the, just the internal structure. And it's a very, very important fact about diodes. So a sort of a more, or sort of a, a better model of a diode would be an ideal diode, so the, the on-off diode, a little bit of resistance, because it's a physical thing, and a little, little tiny battery with a very small voltage of like 0.6 volts to account, to account for this, this, this charge in it that generates this built-in voltage of 0.8 volts. Now, I'm not going to tell you exactly the link between this charge and this voltage, but just believe me, there's a, there's a built-in voltage of about 0.6 volts. That's all you need to understand. So <coughs> what this means is, if we, look at a real, if we look at a real diode, so here's our absolutely ideal diode, Here's the one with a resistance, and here's the one with a little bit of built-in voltage. 
because it's got this sort of little built-in voltage, it means to actually turn it on, you've not only got to supply a positive voltage, you've actually got to overcome this built-in voltage, which is about 0.6 volts. So to turn on your diode, you've actually got to supply more than 0.6 volts, okay? So to turn it on, you've got to go like 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So at 0.3 volts, it'll still be off because you've not yet overcome this sort of internal voltage, okay? And this is very important for various reasons. And one is because <coughs> you're always going to lose 0.6 volts over your diode. So if in the ideal case, for your ideal diode, your supply, you know, you've picked a transformer, for example. Imagine you want, want 5 volts, and you say, oh, I'll get a 240 volt to 5 volt transformer. Well, the problem is your diode is going to suck up 0.6 volts due to this built-in voltage. So rather than having a nice 0.5 volt output, it's going to be 5 minus 0.6, so you're going to be at like 4.4 uh, volts. So the point is, when you're designing a power supply, make sure it, the transformer can supply a bit more than you actually need, because the diodes are going to suck up 0.6 volts, then your voltage regulator is going to suck up a bit more. And importantly, this means also that you'll, because, yeah, right, okay. <coughs> now then, now we know about this, have you got any questions about this sort of internal voltage of diodes? Any burning questions? Any of you confused? Shout, hand up, Should I hear anything? No? All totally happy? That's good. Okay. Now, because now I've taught you a little bit about diodes, we can now go and look at solar cells. And solar cells is what I do sort of every day. And they're a really fantastic, exciting um, thing. So I'll just have a little look at solar cells now. So firstly, let's look at different types of diodes. So these diodes, typically, these power diodes that we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, are all made of this stuff called silicon. But what can happen, and this doesn't emit light. This is not very well, anyway. Um, <coughs> but what happens if we change the material the diode's made of to something like gallium arsenide, um, what happens is the diode can start emitting light when you put current through it. So um, if, you, if you make, here's our diode, if you make it something slightly different, it can emit red or green or blue. And this is how, effectively, um, you get LEDs and lasers. So, and lasers also, if you, they're made of things like gallium arsenide. So literally just change the material of your diode and you've got effectively a laser or a light emitting device. Now then, from a diode to a solar cell. So why solar cells? You're like, well, what, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer. Why do I need to know about solar cells? Well, very often, you, there is no main supply to tap into. So very often, you need to power your device from something. Um, you know, imagine you're, you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere. You've got no power. Very often, um, you need to generate your own power. And you know, the extreme example might be this Mars rover, where it re there really is no mains on Mars, so you need some type of a solar panel. Well, sort of the, the, other, the other extreme is this road sign. Now, you might see these road signs of these solar panels. They're not doing it to be environmentally friendly at all. They're doing it because it costs so much money to put cables in. That it costs hundreds, you know, thousands of pounds per meter to get men to dig holes. It's just often much, much cheaper to slap up a solar cell like that, and problem solved. So very often, you, you will want to generate your own power with solar cells. So I want to give you some type of idea about solar cells. <coughs> now then, coming back to this built-in voltage of our diode. So we notice our diodes effectively, we can think of our diode effectively like a little battery with a tiny little built-in voltage of like 0 0.6, 0 0.6 volts. So let's draw this a bit bigger. So here's our diode, a bit bigger. And it's got this built-in sort of magic voltage of 0.6 volts. And here's a positive and negative terminal. Okay. So now, let's have some light coming into our material. So here's our sun. And we have some photons coming into our diode. Okay. And these photons are going to get absorbed in our material. So this could be a silicon, silicon diode. And what happens is these photons generate charge. So they generate positive charges and negative charges. So these are called electrons and holes. Okay. Now, because we've got 0.6 volts like in our diode already, what happens is this voltage effectively drags this photogenerated positive and negative charge to the, to the, to the, to the ends of the diode. Okay? And then what happens is we put more photons in, and more photons generate more positive and negative charges. And this 0.6 volts we've got over our diode drags these positive and negative charges to either end of our diode. And we start to see these charges in the external circuit. 
So these, these positive charges get spat out the wires here, and these negative charges get spat out the wire here. So we can see, actually, our diode is now generating electricity. And it's all because our diode's made of this n-type and p-type material with a charge in it that generates this 0.6 volts. <coughs> so um, this is basically how much power is our, is our diode generating from the sun. So we, we know power equals current times voltage. So here we've got some current, I, and we know we've got 0.6 volts because that's roughly what you get over a... Incidentally, if you change material from what your um, diode's made of, you get different voltages. So, you know, you might get 0.8 or 1.1 or, or whatever. But anyway, in this case, it's silicon, so we've got 0.6 volts. N is the number of photons absorbed per second. So the A is the area of the solar cell. So if we go power equals area of the solar cell, so how big is it, times the number of photons per second that are hitting it, times the charge on a, um, on an electron times voltage. And we basically got a solar cell that generates power. That's it. So we've learned not only about diodes, we've learned about solar cells too. And it really doesn't get more complicated than that. So, you'll go. Um, so this could be an example question. A 0.01 meter solar cell produces a voltage of 0.6 volts and absorbs um, 1 times 10 to the 20 meters, uh, photons per meter squared per second. If the charge on an electron is 1 times 10 to the 6 to the minus 19 coulombs, how much power will it produce? So there's the equation. Area, number of photons, charge, voltage over the diode. Um, power produced, by, so what is the power it produced? And how many Hello Kitty uh, toasters could we, could we power with our solar cell? Okay, so off you go. Have a go with that. Literally need to multiply a few numbers together. So I'm expecting the answer incredibly quickly, especially from the man who's downloaded the notes off the internet with the answers. <laughs> he, who's, got, who's got it? He's going to shout it out. What's, what power does our solar cell produce? Go on. I do this just so you remember, basically, so you remember, remember what it's all about. I think having a go, it helps you. You got an answer there? I see an answer on the calculator. What'd you get? What'd you get? Go on. 0 0.06 watts. So we've got an answer of 0 0.06 watts. Is that how many, how many ketoses will that power? 0.6 watts, 500 watts on a toaster. No toasters, okay? So we're not going to be powering any toasters from our solar cell. Right. How do we fix this? So, what, so the answer to this was 0 0.06 watts. So who got that? Hands up. Who got that? Well, I know somebody in the back definitely got it. So the answer was 0 0.06 watts. Now, that's not enough to power anything, let alone a toaster. Okay, that's fairly useless. So, what we do <coughs> to get more power is we just make our diode bigger. So here's a diode. This is literally a power diode with a positive and negative here. Now, the only difference between a little power diode you use, might use in a device and a big, big solar cell is they've literally just made it from a tiny thing to a big thing. They've just literally made it much, much broader. So if we sort of stretch out the area of our diode like that, we get a solar cell. And these solar cells typically aren't that big, something like that. And we, we get more power. So now we've got enough power to run our toaster. The other thing we can do to make... Um, to get, get more, more power from our, um, from, our, from our solar cell is to have a bigger voltage. Well, you can sort of engineer the materials of this solar cell to give you a bigger voltage here, but it's a bit tricky. So what people usually do is just like with batteries, you literally stack them in series. You have 0.6 volts, 0.6 volts, 0.6 volts. And over this whole lot, you have 3 volts. So here's actually an individual solar cell here. So that's about that big. And what they do is they put them in panels, um, and they put maybe 100 of them in a big panel like that. So on your roof, you might have, say, 100 of these in series or something, and that'll give you, you know, a couple of hundred volts or something. So that is now basically solar cells. And there you go. So here you can actually see, so if we go back, so this, that's, that's the individual diode. So that's literally just one diode. And this is it in a solar panel. So you can actually see the individual diodes there, 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 all these little squares. And you can power quite a lot from that. That would probably, you know, that's probably enough to run a house, something like that, you know. Quite a lot of energy coming out of that. And then again, um, <coughs> you know, so 
Now, effectively, we can power our device off the, off the mains, or we can power it off solar cells. So that's basically the end of the lecture. Um, if there's, are there any questions about this? Okay. So that's basically it. So um, there will be an examples class tomorrow. Arthur and myself will be there, and we'll just be picking up odd little bits. You know, there's, there's no, I don't think there's any big, big things we're doing tomorrow. So that's it. Have a nice afternoon, everybody.